guys, just so everybody knows, this meeting is going to be recorded and hopefully it'll, it will get put up on uh, YouTube and the OREB Facebook page in the next day. Um, we shall see. Anyway, uh, so welcome everybody. This is not the very best day to have a meeting. Uh, there's a lot going on. Half of the people on our board are just crawling out of the California uh, Democratic <laughs> Convention that's gone on all weekend. And uh, we'll hear about that later. And there are other people that are planning on going to the Vigil for Peace in Ukraine beginning at 5.30 at Lake Merritt Pagoda. And I think there's other things too, but uh, had we planned ahead, we would have maybe had this a different day. But anyway, uh, people are coming in. So today what we're mostly about is continuing the Our Revolution East Bay endorsement process. Uh, we started out um, in February and we ended up um, having six candidates that got endorsed by our membership and who they are, if you don't know, they're Alfred Tu, Janani Ramachandran, Jennifer Easton, Elisa Castro, Diana Becton, and Roxanne Garza. So big congratulations to all of them. And uh, there, a lot of them are already out doing big things in organizing like Jennifer Esteen's having a huge canvas and barbecue on March 12th. Janani Ramachandran's gonna have her main official rollout event in a canvas on March 26th. Uh, Pamela Price, who we endorsed quite a while ago, has a good team of people out working, regular phone banks, house parties. In fact, several of us from uh, OREB went out yesterday to the downtown Berkeley market and we gave away at least 200 uh, brochures. Uh, she was really well received yesterday. So check out our newsletter and that's gonna list uh, all of these things in the next couple of days. And we're gonna try to keep this going, letting people know ways they can participate. We've got some amazing people that we need to be out there working for. We've endorsed them, we need to also support them. So um, let me just mention now, if you wanna be a voting member of OREB, there's two things. One, you have to pay and you go to our website. If somebody could put uh, that up on the chat, that would be great. Uh, basically, do start at $5 a year and go up. So find something that works for you. Join us. Uh, you'll be able to vote. You also have to go through a participation requirement. And what that's all about is you can't just come in off the street and pay your five bucks and vote, but you have to actually either come to three meetings or events or canvassing things that OREB has sponsored within a year. And uh, it's, not, it's not a big ask, but we, we do hope everybody that's here, if they're not a member, does join and uh, get involved. Okay, so tonight we're gonna continue on hearing from uh, the different people who are running. Uh, what we're trying to do is get people that are running in the primary and we're also supplementing it with a few people that are running in only November. Okay, so who we have tonight and not necessarily in this order, we have Aisha Wahib, Rebecca Kaplan, George Syrup, John Garamendi possibly, Cheryl Seduth, Devin Murphy, Kate Harrison, Ruskell, Kayang Yang, and we might have somebody else drop in too, because sometimes there's a little confusion about things. So I think we're ready to get started. Uh, we got a lot of people here now. And uh, the first person we're going to start with uh, is uh, Rebecca Kaplan. And I, I think Mark Van Landen is going to do the introductions on people. Is that right, Mark? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I know well, you're going to do some. But, I'll, uh, just, 
I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Rebecca. Okay, uh, go for uh, it. <laughs> okay uh, so I'm going to, Rebecca, I'm going to have to uh, construct an introduction in my mind. Um, we, have a, we have a powerhouse of progressives, of progressive superstars on this meeting right now. And Rebecca has been, my gosh, she's been on the forefront of defossifying uh, Oakland's uh, public transit. And that is super important because we're in the middle of uh, this crisis in the Ukraine. And 10% of everything that we put into our, our gas tank is Putin's money. We're giving money to Putin. And so Rebecca is helping change that culture. And she has successfully uh, done it, uh, is making it happen in Oakland. And in, she's an inspiration to uh, public officials all across the country for, for her efforts in this. Um, without any further ado, Rebecca, forgive this uh, hodgepodge of introduction, but please welcome Oakland City Council Member, uh, Rebecca Kaplan, Rebecca. Thank you so much. No, I'm I'm very touched. Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and such a pleasure to be with all of you. I have also put my link in the chat for those who want to read more uh, than what we will cover in our brief uh, time together this evening, as of course I want to respect everybody else's time as well. But thank you. It is my incredible honor uh, to be with you tonight as I seek your endorsement and support in my candidacy for the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, which is on the June ballot. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Rebecca Kaplan. I currently serve as the Oakland City Council Member at Large and Oakland Vice Mayor. Um, in addition to that, I previously served on the board of AC Transit, which is also elected, which is where I got my start in zero emission technology, which we have continued to build uh, for Oakland and for the entire region. I did my undergraduate work at MIT, where I worked with uh, student groups to successfully divest our campus from apartheid era South Africa. I went to Stanford for law school, where I had the honor to study uh, with Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow, and got involved in the movement against mass incarceration. I worked as a legal aide for prisoner legal services uh, and helped write and pass the first in the nation uh, successful measure to end cannabis prohibition <laughs> by, by replacing it with a tax and regulate approach. Uh, Yes, and cannabis prohibition, yay, uh, I think that was. Um, in addition, I worked as an attorney uh, doing tenants' rights and worker rights cases. In the spring of 2003, we were protesting one of the other wars for oil, the Iraq war at the Port of Oakland, uh, when police opened fire with tear gas and beanbag pellets, and I was part of the movement to ban the use of tear gas against peaceful demonstrators. As your Oakland council member, I have successfully passed a community safety civilian responder program uh, known as MACRO, which allows for a healthier uh, non-armed response to people in mental health distress and struggling with other issues. We have launched a nation leading zero emission truck program to reduce emissions and oil consumption. We fought successfully to save Head Start, which was threatened uh, with closure. And uh, recently we have been very actively part of the fight to save Oakland public schools. One of the major efforts going on in government throughout our region now is about protecting core public services and making sure workers and the public are well served. And so now I come to you seeking your support to run for county supervisor because the county oversees the bulk of the money for homeless services, oversees public health, controls hundreds of millions of dollars that haven't yet been allocated. And together we have the opportunity to house the homeless, to expand support for civilian responder programs with the county's resources, to make sure we're using public land for public good, such as affordable housing, and to build a stronger and healthier future for our community. And I would be very honored to have your support. And I believe I'm also to leave time for questions and answers. Uh, so I'm happy to do that as well. My website is supervisorkaplan.org, uh, which I have placed in the chat uh, so that you can read more there as well. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Rebecca. Pithy and concise. Um, 
Let's open it up to questions. If anybody wants to ask anything, we have a question from Sherry. Sherry, go ahead. Um, Rebecca, I managed to work with Wilma Chen on uh, trying to get the sheriff's department. And I know this, the board of C supervisors oversees. Um, could you explain uh, your position on um, auditing department and Santa Rita jail? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for your dedication to that. Uh, yes, I helped us pass through the Oakland City Council a resolution calling for a full and independent audit of the Sheriff's Department, and I believe that it is essential for the supervisors to use their power as determining the countywide budget to make sure that we are funding core needs rather than continuing to feed mass incarceration. Uh, in, at the Oakland level, I have successfully uh, increased funding for violence prevention, for in-house civilian safety responders, and at the county level, there's an even larger budget uh, that they control. And so, for example, we need mental health services to be provided outside of the incarceration environment. I know that's a very live fight right now at the Board of Supervisors, and, and so I would bring my successful track record of fighting for and funding healthier community-based strategies and bring that to the county level. Thank you for that. We have a Thank question you. from, from uh, Elisa. Elisa, go ahead. Good evening. Um, thank you, Honorable Kaplan, for running for the seats and for being here with us. Uh, Sherry kind of took my question, was gonna ask around what is your position on criminal justice specifically with the sheriff given all of the current crises that are going on with the jail and that office. Um, so I invite you to say anything else about funding or alternatives or sheriff's oversight. And uh, my other question is just if you are not accepting contributions from any certain contributors or entities. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I am not accepting contributions. Uh, from the mass incarceration industry, uh, which would include both the, the, both the private prisons and the, the sheriff and their related entities. Uh, in terms of your broader question, yes, it, this is something I have been deeply committed to throughout my life. The strategy in America for decades has been one that costs money and costs lives. The United States incarcerates a greater share of its population than any other democracy and has resulted in worsening situations for families, for communities, and for violence. And that's part of why it is so important that we invest in violence prevention, that we invest in the kind of supports that prevent that cycle of reincarceration, such as job training, mental health support, affordable housing, uh, and those types of strategies that help people rebuild their lives rather than locking them into a pattern. So, uh, and, and I wanna be clear, this isn't just something I say I would do because I'm now running for this other seat. I successfully worked in Oakland to pass ban the box so that people coming out of incarceration could get jobs. We successfully worked to remove drug testing, to remove incarceration for substance use and to shift money toward violence prevention and toward civilian responders. Uh, the last thing I would say is besides the budgetary aspect and the need for more preventative services, there's also the problem of some really horrific cases of abuse that have been documented taking place within the county jails. And so this is both a question of where we put our money. It's also a question of where we put our values and protecting our communities. Thank you. We have a final question from Kabir. Kabir, go ahead. Kabir. Uh, hey, Rebecca, just there you go. Who your uh, opponents are. Can you hear me? Uh, go ahead and repeat that, Kabir. Uh, yeah, just curious of who your opponents are, if any at all. Who you're running uh, against. Thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, as a matter of principle, I don't consider myself to be running against anyone. It is an open seat, uh, but also on a practical level, the close of filing is next week, so we don't actually yet have confirmation uh, as to who the other candidates are. Uh, but I want to say there is no doubt 
that I am the progressive candidate, the candidate with the experience actually implementing our progressive values in the real world, who knows how local government works and how to build coalitions to advance our shared values. And so I would be incredibly honored to have your support. I was very honored uh, to receive recently the endorsement in this race from the Wellstone Democratic Renewal Club, uh, among others. Um, and in uh, my last race, I was also uh, endorsed uh, by yourselves and uh, Bernie Sanders as well. And so I seek to bring this track record of putting progressive values into action and bring that to the County Board of Supervisors, which controls so many of the important resources that impact people's lives. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you so much for making the time today. And I hope you will forgive me for that in introduction for the rest of my life. I hope you won't hold that against me. Really appreciate Really, really appreciate making the time and uh, uh, good luck on the campaign. Well, no, no forgiveness is needed because you did great. <laughs> but if you want it, uh, bless you for that too. And, and thank you all so much. I would be very honored to have your support. And you can reach us uh, through the website that's in the chat as well if you have any follow-ups. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, the next person that's going to be speaking is Berkeley City Council member Kate Harrison. And Mark, would you like to say a word or two about her? Uh, I could say a thousand words about Kate Harrison. I'll make it quick. Uh, she is a progressive superhero, simply put. And uh, as city council member for, for Berkeley, she, boy, she's been a model of uh, progressive intelligence and commitment. And she's the best of the best. And um, I'll just leave it at that and hand it over to our friend, Kate Harrison, Kate. Well, Mark, thank you very much. That was really kind. I'm, I'm really glad to see everybody here. And I'm so sorry we haven't been able to be together in person. I am looking forward to that day so much. Um, you know, I started my career at a place called the Center for the Study of Race, Crime, and Social Policy, which looked at the um, disparate impacts of the police and criminal justice system on different communities in the city of Oakland. And I then went on to work for the ACLU and looked at, at what had happened under COINTELPRO when the FBI investigated people in the Black Panthers and other groups using horrible techniques to destroy them as individuals and to bring down uh, left movements. And I also worked on just cause eviction for uh, the um, uh, state of California. And why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because everything that's old is new again. These are the exact same fights we're having today. We've been in a terrible period of retrenchment under COVID. While we've all been at home, people that I won't just say the right, I'll say neoliberals have been taking advantage of this time to look at what I consider, use what I consider the shock doctrine that Naomi Klein talked about. They have used this time to come back and say, no, we don't really want police reform. We want to go backwards and add police and ignore everything that's been said about racial justice. No, we really don't want income equality. We can't let those workers get away with walking off the job, etc. And no, we really don't want to worry about the environment because I want to order all my stuff from Amazon and I'm worried that, you know, Ukraine is going to be is being invaded and I won't have my Russian oil, etc. So this period has been, for me, the hardest time I've ever seen in office the last two years because of this great effort, the other side to take advantage of this. And that also, I should say, includes real estate developers who are seeing this opening, seeing our inability to meet together and, and object to what they're doing. So um, I also see this, though, as our opportunity. This is our chance to fight back. And now that we're going to be able to go out and meet with people, I think we have a real chance here. Um, I am organizing my city council race around campaign issues and refusing to be afraid of saying what I think is the truth on many things. That includes I'm working harder on police reform, not less. We are looking right now at reimagining policing still in the city of Berkeley, bringing more social service supports and re removing the police from things that they do not need to be involved in. And we're getting a lot of pushback on our council for that. I'm still pushing forward on fair and impartial policing. This is about not what the police do, but how they do it. Are they doing their work in a fair and impartial way? And we know they're not in terms of stops, arrests, et cetera. But we're getting pushback. People now want to reintroduce the idea that people on probation and parole can be stopped and searched at any time. When just last year, we voted against that. 
And I've also been putting forward legislation on reducing use of force, no facial recognition, against surveillance generally, and banning tear gas and militarization. Um, at the same time, I'm working hard on support for workers. I have right now the Fair Work Week legislation that requires that employees be given at least two weeks notice of their schedule. We know a lot of part-time low-income workers have many jobs to support their families. And when they show up to work and they're canceled right then and there without any compensation, that's a day their family doesn't eat. So I've been working on that. We've been looking at labor peace, which says that uh, concessionaires of our properties like hotels and restaurants that operate at the marina have to recognize the unions that operated in the former operator of that hotel or restaurant. And we've been looking at support just generally of our public service employees. There's been a big attack on our employees and a lack of understanding of their needs under COVID particularly. Um, Finally, a big area for me is climate equity. Um, it's not enough for us to say, those of us that can afford an electric car or a great you know, electric heat pump that, oh, that's wonderful, we'll just go out and do that. We need to make this possible for everyone. I established the Climate Equity Fund, which sets aside money for prevailing wage workers to work with low-income renters and homeowners on making their homes energy efficient, using less GHGs and making the environment healthier. This is a triple win for workers, for, for people that live in homes and for the environment. Um, and finally, in the whole area of housing, I introduced the first sanctioned encampment in Berkeley, which has been very successful. My colleague said it can't be done. We can't have a sanctioned encampment. We can't allow homeless people to decide when they're gonna come and go. We can't have a system that's this open, it won't work. And in May, we went of last year and we opened this sanctioned encampment shelter and it has proven to be a huge success. And finally, we're working on social housing. Um, also, we haven't been quiet about organizing other people, which I think is the, the way we move forward. As Michael knows, and as um, other people on this call know, we've reinvigorated the Berkeley Progressive Alliance. We're working hard to bring us all back together to work on these common issues. It's not about me, it's about a movement. And I hope you will um, support me in this movement. And I really appreciate being here with all of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Um, is there any questions for Council Member Kate Harrison? Sherry Johansson, go ahead, Sherry. Oh, I, I, we can't hear you, Sherry. Oh, you'd think after a whole weekend of doing this that I would <laughs> automatically. Um, Kate, it's so nice to have you and, and hear your ideas. Um, I'm not as well versed on what the problems are, but could you kind of talk about the, the situation at the university and, and housing and, and that whole situation for us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I was the lone no vote on settling the litigation with the university because I felt they were not supporting their students sufficiently. In many other cities that have uh, campuses, they've required that the campus purchase you know property within the city, but build the housing before they admit a large number of new students. The agreement that was reached in Berkeley did not require that. It instead said that whatever the university purchased, as long as it had 80% student housing, there would be no EIR and the city promised not to sue them about those projects. What does that mean for rent control tenants? That means the university can buy anything and kick people out, essentially. Um, I was very concerned that we did not have a commitment to housing first, then adding population. Um, I was also concerned that the EIR generally was terrible. It did nothing on transportation. UC's attitude has always been, well, we're the elite and you know, we know you have this goal of no carbon and of people not doing single passenger vehicle trips, but we don't care. We're gonna add all this parking. We're not gonna add any bus travel. We don't, we claim that we've cut our greenhouse gases, but we've cut our greenhouse gases on campus because they have moved 5,000 employees off campus to West Berkeley, where they are using just as many resources as they ever have. So I was very disappointed by the EIR and I was frankly disappointed by the vote of my colleagues. When it came to the final uh, question that came up a few weeks ago about whether we should actually join in saying that the university should not be able to add students at this point um, because of the failure of the EIR, I didn't vote for that. And I didn't vote for that because I didn't see the point in punishing students 
This is about UC as an institution. This is about their failure to plan. It's not about the students. So um, it's been a very complicated situation. The Supreme Court turned down the appeal from UC. They have been told they cannot add these students until they do a reasonable EIR. And this entire thing really is about an attack on EIRs. In the meantime, we've had the state legislature introduce legislation saying whenever a college campus wants to do anything, they shouldn't have to do an EIR. EIRs are not evil. EIRs are the way we plan. And so I see this in a much bigger context and I'm very concerned about, about where this is all going. But thank you for asking that, Sherry. We have another question uh, from Kabir. Kabir, go ahead. Hey, Kate, uh, same question. Uh, who are you running against? Or I guess, well, who's running against you since you're the incumbent? Um, I'm not certain. We have had redistricting in Berkeley and one of my former opponents spent many, 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 many weeks trying to get me districted out and that did not succeed. Um, I don't think he's running. I'm unclear who is gonna run right now. Um, it's, not, it's not been announced, um, but I can tell you that last time I ran, the police union and the realtors spent more against me than I spent on my own campaign. I do public financing. They had ads saying that I was a terrorist because I supported homeless people, that I didn't support the police fighting violent crime, et cetera. So I'm expecting these same um, tactics again, whoever the candidate is. Kate, are you still technically district four? I am still district four, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, we have a question from Joaquin. Joaquin, go ahead. Joaquin, uh, does, I think you're muted. Oh, how does that public finance work? And are you horribly outspent by real estate and private businesses? Or is it pretty, pretty good legislation for Berkeley public finance? It's, it's very good in terms of the direct spending um, because every candidate that pledged to take public financing, which I was the first to do that, we received $60 maximum from individuals, no corporate, no LLC, nothing, just people. And it's matched six to one by the city. So for every $60 contribution from a Berkeley resident, I get 360 from the city. In terms of the spending on the other side, they are, um, I think sort of forced into doing public financing because people see that as a good, but what we can't control are independent expenditure campaigns. And that's the real rub. You know, we have honestly the Realtors, you know, Association, which by the way, our local realtors don't really agree with. They would like to protect neighborhoods. They would like to sell homes to people. They don't really want to be aligned with people that are saying, you know, tear everything down. But you know, they're not in charge of their national organization, but their independent expenditure campaign is the one that spent more against me than I actually spent myself. There's nothing I can do about that. So let's say I wasn't in public financing and I raised, instead of the 60,000 I have, $100,000, they'd spend 150. It would never end. So all we really have is people going out on the street and campaigning. And now that we can knock on doors again, I think we can really do well with that. And it's always a pleasure to knock doors for people that are as great as Kate Harrison. Uh, East Bay is lucky to have her. Kate Harrison, uh, City of Berkeley, District 4, one of the Thank great you. leaders in our movement, a visionary. And being a visionary requires courage, and she certainly has that. Kate Harrison, thank you for being here. Thank Appreciate you, Mark. It. Thank you, Mark. I look forward to seeing everybody in person, as I said. I'm tired of being in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Well, thank you very much. We, some of us went out to downtown Berkeley in person and did a table event yesterday. So check Tremendous us out fun. at the market if nowhere else. Yeah, it's opening up. Thank yeah. you again. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, Kate. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, the next person we have, I, I think many of you also know her. She's another superstar here. Um, her name is Aisha Wahib. She is currently on the city council of Hayward, California, where she's been, I believe four years. She's made huge inroads to problems in Hayward, just huge. Uh, Aisha actually comes from an Afghan refugee family. Uh, I don't know if you all know that or not. And she's a big opposition person for all war. And I know she'll really push that. In the, uh, her time in uh, Hayward, one of the big things, one of many that she worked on was affordable housing for everybody. 
anyway, uh, I will let Aisha tell you about herself. Go ahead, Aisha. Welcome. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate being here. Um, I, I, I'm not going to lie, I submitted my information very last minute. So thank you for squeezing me in. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, genuinely, my name is Aisha Wahab. I'm a Hayward City Council member, and I have decided to run for state Senate. I'm very proud to announce that officially today we are the California Democratic Party's uh, endorsed candidate for this race. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and it's it's a first for the party as well um, in, in many ways. So, you know, we're making progress as we see more representation in our state. Um, and as, as Carol really stated, you know, affordable housing has always been my number one concern. And, and the reason for that is because you know, I grew up in foster care. I was born in New York City to uh, Afghan refugee, and my father was actually murdered in New York. Um, my father was murdered. It's a cold case, and uh, my sister and I ended up in the foster care system. Uh, we lived with a lot of different people. I grew up going to church. I grew up with different languages around me, and genuinely, I think we want very much the same thing, and that is really what I'm running on. Um, we need to get back to the basics. We need food on the table, a roof over our head, um, a quality public education, and jobs with benefits. You know, these are the core uh, issues that all families care about. And I care about the most vulnerable community members because that is the society that we build our community on. It is the foundation of everything. If we can make sure that our most vulnerable members have an opportunity, are able to obtain a good education, housing, and so much more, um, everyone else is most likely guaranteed to, to be able to do the same. So I really focus on that. In Hayward, I will say that I have challenged a lot of different industries, whether it's um, you know challenging folks on multifamily uh, complexes and and rents and so forth. I expanded rent control from 1,000 units to 10,000 units. Um, I made sure that a lot of our new development has affordable housing uh, components um, built into it. For example, the 100 acres of Caltrans property is slated to have about 30% affordable housing um, because we need to build housing for our residents, right? Um, so th that is incredibly important to me. I will say I tackled public safety reforms before um, the incident with George Floyd, uh, specifically, you know, independent investigation for all officer involved shootings that result in a death, as well as the full removal of mental health and homeless calls from our PD now being handled by our paramedics, which are technically our firefighters, they're all trained paramedics. And um, making sure that we consistently improve, you know, in, in a society that that we generally all believe that we should all feel safe in. You know, I constantly say that nobody is above the law, and I do believe that. Um, the other couple of items that we have focused on is, you know, I, I pushed for the no nuclear option in the EBCE, um, basically removed um, gasoline to or gas, I should say, to be used for any new development. Um, expanded our solar, um, have really, really pushed our city to focus on our Hayward shoreline that is a hidden treasure in Hayward uh, with a $900 million investment over the course of 20 years to protect our shoreline. Um, and I will say that if elected to the state Senate, I do plan on pushing all of these issues and much more. I want to continue the work that we do in Hayward across this state um, specifically, it was interesting to me to know that I would be the only renter in the state Senate. Um, that is quite shocking in itself. Um, and as a caretaker in my own right, I also know how difficult it is for families to balance what I call modern day families. You know, uh, we want people to be able to age in place. And oftentimes it is my generation that is trying to balance whether or not they want to start their own family or take care of their aging parents or move out of this area. And there's a lot of complications that come with that. I am the only candidate endorsed by Planned Parenthood as well. Um, and I wanna go beyond just protecting the right to choose, but also really focus on modern day family planning. This is adoption, this is IVF, this is um, healthcare as a whole, equal pay and so much more. Um, since we are in International Women's Month, um, you know, I, I really wanna highlight some of the issues that I really want to focus on that I don't think are is being talked about at that level. So I'm happy to answer any questions and provide any feedback I can. 
Thank you, Aisha. Uh, I think we have two hands up. Uh, the first hand that I see is Joaquin. Joaquin, go ahead and ask your question. Joaquin, you're muted. I think his question was from before, but I'm not. Oh, my mistake. Well, then I think the next question is from Kabir, and I can't wait for him to ask this question. Kabir, go ahead. Uh, same question, Aisha, and I'll actually ask the question from the chat, too, if you could say which district you're running for. So uh, who are your opponents and what district are you running for? Thank you. Uh, it's Senate District 10. Uh, Senate District 10 spans from about Hayward down to the northern section of San Jose. So we do go into San Jose. And because of redistricting, we dropped some of the unincorporated area and absorbed all of Sunnyvale. So it's Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, San Jose, Milpitas, Newark, Fremont Union City, Fairview, and Hayward. Um, so this is a, a pretty broad territory. I will say that this, this district is the most populous district in the state Senate, right? Out of the entire st state of California, this is the most populous with over 1 million people, over 500,000 individual voters and a lot of territory to cover, I will say that. So if anybody wants to volunteer to, to touch more people and touch more homes, um, we're, we're very happy to have some support. Um, my main opponents, I, I will say that uh, we do have an opponent, um, a couple of them, a Republican named Paul Pimentel. Um, we don't know who's really gonna file, but um, we have the mayor of Fremont, uh, Lily May, uh, Jim Canovo uh, from, I think, Santa Clara School Board and uh, a handful of other folks as well. Sherry, go ahead with your question. Aisha, I'm so delighted that you were endorsed um, officially today. That's, that's just such great news. Um, everybody in this room uh, was very disappointed that uh, AB 1400 didn't go through. And we care a great deal about the universal health care and single payer. Um, and when you get to the Senate, will you be an advocate? Will you be an endorser? How will you uh, support universal health care? Definitely. I've historically supported it. Um, Osh Cholera and Alex Lee have endorsed our campaign. We've talked about this. I think, you know, one of the things that I've stated is that, you know, we kind of make, need to make this more understandable for the average voter. Right, because when I meet people that are opposed to it, I just don't get it. Right, I'm like, why are you opposed to it? Right, so um, I don't know where that's coming from. And in Sacramento, you know, when I go to Sacramento, it's, it's shocking how many industries, uh, specifically healthcare industries, are involved. Right, um, it's a very small town. Everyone talks to each other. Um, it's it's problematic. And I, I was also disappointed, uh, very similar to yourself, that it didn't go to a vote. You know, in um, that that helps us as regular voters and activists to really understand, OK, who's really on our side? Right. Um, I, I know all of you guys feel that way. And I've seen that even in Hayward. Right. When I pushed for accelerating the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour, uh, we are the, the least affluent city in this district. And at that time, even we were the, the least affluent city with compared to our surrounding neighborhoods. Right. And um, they, they said that, oh, we, we do a four nods policy, literally a head nod in a Bay Area city where the city manager determines whether or not they were supportive of an idea or not. I was shocked, right? Genuinely shocked. Like, I, you know, I heard one person when I pushed for uh, more mental health and de-escalation training for a PD, uh, you know, a month later, they said they sneezed, even though they voted for it, supposedly. So uh, the fact that we need, uh, you know, kind of like a record. So I, I fully support that. And it's it, it was disappointing. And, and yes, I, I will be supportive of, um, another version of this uh healthcare for all so so we'll we'll definitely try to be working on that all right uh aisha aisha wahab running for district 10 running for california state senate and when she is elected aisha will be a game changer and truly <laughs> Don't add pressure, really? but I do just want to highlight this. This is the feedback we have been getting on the ground, and, and I really hope that everybody uh, chips in, in in their own way. The majority of people who are Democrats, who are you know uh, historically very supportive of a lot of the initiatives, um, they are saying that they will be sitting this election out. Right? They're very frustrated. You know, different excuses from COVID to the gas prices to inflation to you name it. 
And I worry about that because we all know that that there's a lot of open seats throughout the state of California. It's not just mine, but it's many, many seats. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of people here will volunteer with the campaigns that they feel tied to um, because we're going to need all the help we can get. So I, those are my two cents and my, my call to action. And I appreciate you guys' time. Thank you. Thank you Aisha, like thank you so, so much for coming. I, I, I know there was some miscommunications and we're really glad you made it. Carol, with your permission, can I do a little footnote to yes. what Aisha just said? So progressives cannot be absent in 2022. So for instance, Aisha, her main opponent is an anti-LGBTQ who's, who's the favorite of big developers. Progressives are gonna be, are gonna make the difference in who wins that uh, state Senate district election. So our efforts, progressives efforts to make sure that people like, great people like Aisha win it's, it's so consequential. We cannot be discouraged. We got to see, you know, we got to keep our eyes on that victory. And that's all. Just wanted to put that footnote in. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Okay, we'll, we'll see you later. Okay, moving along, our next uh, candidate uh, is Rusko Kayenying, uh, who lives up in Vallejo. Uh, although he's done a lot down here in Alameda County and in Contra Costa County. Uh, I first met him, he was an aide for Javanka Beckles back in what, 2018, I think when she was running for office. And uh, so got to know him then. He also spent some time in Berkeley uh, as an aide to Cheryl Davila. He was on, I believe, Vallejo School Board as an elected position. Um, everything I ever go to in the Bay Area, whether it's San Francisco or Oakland, Berkeley, he is always there working. He's just one of the strongest activists that we have. So now he's running for city council in Vallejo, and we'd like to hear about it. Welcome, Roscoe. Wow, thank you, Carol, and uh, happy Women's History Month, and also happy Social Work Month. Uh, my aunt um, was a social worker for 40 years, and um, uh, we have to thank our frontline workers, especially our social workers uh, who are serving those in need. And thank you for uh, the quick intro. Um, I have grown up um, in Vallejo and the Bay Area for over 30 years. I'm a, I was born in the Philippines and came to Vallejo and the Bay Area uh, 30 years ago and have and have still remained here since then. Um, my first job was uh, working as an intern at Vallejo City Hall um, in 2007. And, I, and that's where I started my public service career is, is like right in high school, starting to get involved in a community and, and, and in politics. Um, and, and as Carol mentioned, I've worked for uh, elected officials um, like Javanka Beckles and Cheryl Davila, who have been previously endorsed by Our Revolution East Bay. So I'm really thankful uh, for OR East Bay for supporting in their campaigns. Um, and, and as I was serving on the school board for four years from 2014 to 2018, um, uh, my, my track record shows that I listen and I advocate for constituents, for the residents. If you email or call me, um, I'm happy to bring your voice to the decision-making table to read letters on your behalf, uh, despite uh, my colleagues um, not liking my advocacy, but it needs to be heard. Your voice needs to be heard. I also, um, because I would hear so many complaints from residents, students, parents, uh, teachers, uh, I was able to get a state agency to audit um, most of the departments in the school district to validate people's complaints and start to get a work plan to address those uh, problems. And, and I've worked with many people on this call, uh, which I'm so grateful and thankful for, from Carol Peoli to Shell Senate, <laughs> to uh, uh, Bobby Lopez, Matthew Lewis, Kabir, um, <clears throat> um, 
Joaquin, um, and I and I see Cordell Hindler. I remember uh, attending the same Richmond City Council meetings as he did. So the reason why I'm running is um, one of you probably heard about Vallejo uh, recently. The pot people residents taking um, in their own hands to fill potholes on their own. You probably heard about, um, unfortunately, our police department. And Vallejo is heading in the wrong direction. We're a working class town of 120,000. Um, we pay uh, one of the highest fees in the state from uh, garbage fees to utility fees, sales tax. But yet, uh, Vallejo residents are not getting um, little to no service. Uh, City Hall is, is running amok and not serving the people. So uh, what I plan to do is we have to audit every city department in Vallejo to address uh, residents' complaints and be more responsive to residents. We have to hold our police department accountable and ensuring um, they're, they're being uh, responsive to residents and, and solving unsolved crimes, not um, clamoring for a fancy waterfront multi-million dollar office building that the city cannot afford. I'm opposed to that. We have to uh, get the county and the state to intervene and support our homeless residents, um, get them into permanent housing and services. I'm someone who uh, has, a, has a record of strongly fighting for the people and taking on big money special interests. Um, since I ran for school board many years ago, it's been my policy to this day and working on uh, campaigns, uh, grassroots candidate campaigns. Um, I refuse to be, uh, I, I refuse to accept donations from law enforcement, um, developers, questionable special interests, fossil fuels, and, uh, Lastly, um, I, I currently serve as a legislative liaison director for Save Our Seniors, advocating for senior care legislation. If you, I'm not sure of, of those that were at the state capitol or watching the state capitol hearings on the AB 1400 healthcare bill. Yes, I spoke at one of those hearings uh, representing the community. And every time I go up to the state capitol, um, uh, I always bring voice to the community. So my name is Rusko Kayang Young. I would be honored with your support. Thank you. Rusko, thank you so much. Um, is there any questions for Rusko? Uh, Cordell, Cordell, go ahead and ask your question for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Hi, can, can, you me, can you hear me, Amar? I sure can. Yes, I can yeah, hear you. So, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for acknowledging me, uh, Russ. Um, I, I, you you asked um you answered one of the questions I was going to ask you know about the how will you be working with the Vallejo Council on um on these um matters you know like regarding like you know like for um okay let, let me rewind that so uh if I mean what do you what is your vision for the overall city of Vallejo you know like for example you know like the budget, because I know this this comes up in every city, not just Vallejo, yeah. but Richmond too. So that's yeah. one. Then it. Then the second question is uh related to the um. Will you be working with um executive management on these um, on these matters? You know, like pertaining to like the budget and uh, retaining of staff. That's a silly question. So. Thank you, Cordell, and it's great to hear you. Um. Like having lived in Vallejo most of my life, especially through the bankruptcy years, uh, which was in 2008, I saw um, candidates who ran for council at that time and then got elected were bought off by the by law enforcement, and they kept rubber stamping city management's uh, proposals uh, to give them raises and whatever they want, which that's why the city had to declare bankruptcy, um, and unfortunately. What I'm seeing is history is repeating itself. Uh, whether it's 2007, 2008, or today in 2022, 46% of, of the city of Vallejo's budget is, is unfortunately eaten up by law enforcement costs. It is not sustainable. We have, uh, we have to rein in on those costs and reallocate those dollars into 
fixing the streets, the potholes, and and the community. Um, I was I remember when I was working for Council Member Davila. Um, I think she may be on this call. I talked to her earlier. Um, she might be on this call. Uh, we worked on, uh, based on feedback from the community, we worked on a council item to um, redirect uh, functions and and cut costs in the Ber in the city of Berkeley Police Department because their uh, budget was way out of whack. Also, um, I have a record of holding city management accountable. Um, or management in general accountable. Uh, like when I was on the school board, um, anytime uh, residents would call me about complaints, I would um, follow up with this uh, superintendent and, and kept following up, uh, making sure their issue was resolved. And if, and if I was not satisfied uh, with the result, then yeah, I would um, give them um, a negative, employee satisfaction, which I have done before. Um, and then when I, and then working for the uh, council member Beckles and, and Davla, I kept um, holding uh, accountable the police chief or the public works director until they helped that resident with their particular issue. So, um, and these are highly paid professionals. So I'm, so I'm a fighter and and I have no problem going toe to toe to holding people and power accountable. Uh, I see that we have a question from, oh my goodness, from Richmond City Council member and uh, member of the Richmond Progressive Alliance and with our help soon to be mayor of the city of Richmond, Eduardo Martinez. Eduardo, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Good to see you, Reskel. Um, Good to see you, council member. When you worked in my office, one of the things that I, I really admired about your advocacy was that you kept abreast of what was going on in other cities. And when you saw something that was meaningful to the city of Richmond, you brought it to my attention. So my question to you is, as a Vallejo city council member, how do you plan to continue working with other city councils throughout the Bay Area? Thank you, council member. Uh... Just to let everyone know, uh, Councilman Martinez and I served on a regional task force on climate emergency and RB Tiny Home Solutions to Homelessness, which was uh, uh, co-founded and led by uh, Council Member Cheryl Davila. So it's so I'm happy to work with uh, you, Council Member, and any elected official um, on this call on on these on regional task forces. We cannot solve our problems. Um, in a silo, we have to look at solutions and ideas in the other cities because we're, we are all facing the same problems. Um, uh, public safety, especially uh, the police department, um, climate emergency, uh, homelessness, um, housing, and, and 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 streets and potholes. So it's uh, one of the things. Um, I would like to propose is a joint powers authority, which is a collection of uh, getting cities to join together as as a uh, uh, jointly uh, to form like a you know just throwing out a legislative idea like a fire protection district where we could share um, services like a like a fire boat. Uh, we could chip in each city could chip in and pay for that fire boat um, because you never know when you need it. So it's it's working collaboratively on these regional task forces and joint powers authorities. Uh, that's that's what I bring to the table. Very good. Okay, uh, real quick uh, final question and quick answer. Quick question, Kabir, go ahead. My brother, hi Kabir. Uh, I can't hear you. Hear you. Breaking up. Who are you running against? Who are you running against? Who are your opponents? Well, uh, this seat's going to be open seat. We're elected by districts now because before I used to run in a when I was when I was on the school board um, and running for re-election for school board, it was at large. So uh, this time it's open. Uh, it's an open seat uh, for a district. Um, there's there's although there are several candidates uh, that are running for that same seat. Um, you know, I'm focused on our campaign. Um, um, I think I'm the only I'm, I'm the only one that has uh, lived in Vallejo 
who has grown up and experienced the day-to-day -day problems and also uh, working for elected officials and learning um, the best practices and ideas so that I could introduce them in Vallejo. Uh, there, there are many council items and resolutions I've worked on in past years where, for example, uh, Vallejo has yet to declare a climate emergency versus while the rest of the Bay Area, um, uh, dozens of cities, which uh, Council Member Martinez and I serve on the climate emergency, climate emergency task force, CEMTF, uh, dozens of cities have declared climate emergency. Vallejo is the holdout. So uh, that's what I plan to introduce is, it, it's, it's straightforward. I've done the work before, whether it's climate emergency, or helping the homeless or police accountability, just introduce uh, uh, past pieces of legislation into Vallejo. Our friend Ruskell, thank you so much. One of the progressive stalwarts in Solano County. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Ruskell. Uh, speaking of Solano County, uh, we have a new congressional district in our midst, a brand new congressional district uh, here in the East Bay, in the Bay Area. It takes up a huge portion of Solano County, Vallejo, Benicia, up to Fairfield, but also includes a lot of South Contra Costa, excuse me, did I say so? North yes. Contra Costa? Yes. 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 Of, yeah, so yes. apologies for that. Richmond, Pinole, into Martinez, and into Antioch. And now we have the question of representation. There's no incumbents in this, uh, in this race. And now it's a question about how we're gonna be represented and who we're going to be putting into the House of Representatives for the Bay Area. We have with us a person who is uh, who has uh, been a long fixture in East Bay politics and is now a director in the West County uh, Wastewater District. She is running for Congressional District Number Eight. She is Cheryl Suddeth. Cheryl. Mark, you said my name right. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Cheryl Suddeth. Yes, so it is a district that encompasses West Contra Costa County. Uh, it looks south on the map, but it's really west. Um, yes, I'm a scientist, a molecular cell biologist and biochemist by training, um, University of Illinois, Illini, and uh, Spelman College. I'm an international negotiator, elected official, as Mark just told you. I have 25 years of writing and helping pass legislation um, locally and nationally. I, up until a couple of years ago, I was back and forth to DC about six to eight times a year, um, Sacramento every week. I spent um, the majority of my career closing billion dollar deals and living in 12 different countries, working for Sony and Siebel and Oracle and uh, Matson Technology and the Department of Defense, Department of Justice. I, I stopped in the middle of my career and spent 14 years working um, for Goodwill International and a division called Canada Industries and the Ability One program, working with people with significant disabilities and our wounded warriors, just working with the people who are unseen, unheard and uncounted to make sure they'd had uh, not just good paying jobs, but prevailing wage jobs and um, benefits, building over 2,500 units of affordable and inclusive housing right there in Alameda County out in Dublin and hiring thousands of individuals who had previously been left out of the job market. When we talk about what can be done, I know it can be done because I've done it right here, especially in the most uh, harshest of times. We, I, I heard Ms. Aisha say earlier about, and, and I've heard several of you talking about this, this title of, of progressive, and I, I often just think back at it that we have these voices that wanna speak for our community. But we have this new district that runs, yes, from Kensington um, across the 80 corridor, uh, across the bridge uh, to Vallejo and all the way to Fairfield and Travis Air Force Base. It picks up Pittsburgh and a small piece of, of Antioch. This district is about 70% Black, Latino, API, Indigenous, and it is incredibly working class. And uh, before, uh, before I get asked at the end of this, we have, a, we have a representative who's decided he doesn't wanna run in his area. He wants to come into this area. He lives 80 miles outside of this district. This district has been situated so that 
we can have people from our area represent us. And just like at this country's founding, if you're not paying taxes here, if you're not breathing the air here, if you're not drinking the water here, it deserves to have people who live here, who work here, who serve here, representing the voice of this community. We, we keep talking about being progressive, but then we keep having these drive-by drop-in politicians who superficially claim they are progressive, who superficially claim to support us and then do nothing, nothing. I just spent a week in, in DC fighting for not just climate justice or climate change, but fighting to get toxins out of our water, fighting to get PFAS and, and PFOA out of our land and soil and listening to politicians act as if they're surprised that this exists because they're not drinking this water, they're not breathing this air. And as an environmental, a true environmental scientist, not one who just says things, but who really knows the effect, somebody with bronchitis, somebody who uses four on crutches, somebody who lost their voice for three years because of the environmental toxins that we breathe every day. We have to say, if we're going to say we believe in progressive policies like Medicare for All, then we have to build equity and access in it from the very beginning. If we say we believe in jobs, then we have to make sure that those jobs don't just pay minimum wage, but they pay prevailing wage for the area that we live in. We don't, we're not the same as Minnesota. We're not the same as Montana. The Bay Area needs to have wages and that reflect the area that we live in. We have to make sure that we do what we've done for the past 25 years that I've been proud to be a fighter of, preventing the jail expansion in Richmond, protecting our immigrant families and neighbors as a part of CETA, Immigration Rights Alliance, organizing SB 54 truth forums, forcing the closure of the immigrant immigration detention centers throughout California, having DA accountability meetings, seceding and fighting to end county juvenile fines and fees in our county that led to a statewide moratorium, having tenant protections, increasing the minimum wage and increasing the power of unions right here. We want health services for formerly incarcerated and undocumented adults right here in Contra Costa. And we enacted the Miles Hall Lifeline and Suicide Prevention Act and the A3 Community Crisis Response. And we enacted the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub for people who have mental disabilities so that the police cannot just kill them at will. And just Friday, we, we succeeded in having the DA not just prosecute an officer who shot Darma Abelera, but he got in prison, not just, not just probation as they were recommending. These are the things we've done on the ground here in Contra Costa in Solano County. And I've had the privilege and opportunity of our community for over 25 years working in collaboration with other groups. And I know for certain that we, if we can continue to have one of us serve, then we can continue to get this work done because this district needs people with real lived experiences who understand what's going on on the ground, not in some, 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 some uh, paper way, but in real life way. So we can prioritize our concerns because the community concerns are my concerns. The community's needs are my needs because my family has been here since 1992 and we're not going nowhere because I know that the rent's too damn high for me, just like it's too damn high for the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much for that. Um, is there any questions for Cheryl? I see Kabir's hand goes up. Go, Kabir, go ahead. Uh, uh, full, full disclosure, I'm on Cheryl's campaign team, but uh, I see the same question. So, uh, Cheryl, who are your opponents? You know, okay. we really have trouble understanding you, Kabir. I, I know his question. <laughs> he say, he asked the same question, <laughs> right? I think Can you hear question. me better? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just had just full disclosure. I was saying I'm on Cheryl's campaign team, but I'm asking the same question. Uh, who are your opponents, Cheryl? My opponents are. Uh, I have to be nice because we're recording. <laughs> One of them is um, uh, the congressman who uh, has decided he doesn't want to run in his own district, Congressman Garamendi. Um, and I thank him for his service. I think he's, he's probably done very well in the area in which he has served. This is just not the right district for him. In a district, as I mentioned before, that is 70% um, black, brown, API, and indigenous, 
and decidedly working class. It deserves someone who is also black, brown, API and indigenous and working class, but who is also well-educated, well-qualified, well-experienced, bold, confident, courageous, rejects the status quo, who doesn't have $3 million in the bank and who knows what he's like to shift bills and say, hey, somebody's not gonna get paid this month, who has student debt that needs to be forgiven, all of it, every penny of it, and who has only one mortgage, it's a lot of money too, and who has the lived experience to guide her decision-making that's gonna benefit the community and the nation, not my cattle ranch. And somebody who's not a cattle rancher and then claims to be an environmentalist because cattle, the number one source of methane, so you can't have both. Yes, so, and that would be me. The other opponent is um, uh, Dimless Johnson III, who sits on the Richmond City Council. Nothing against him either, but he doesn't have the breadth of knowledge or the experience that I have. Another opponent is uh, Edwin Rush, and he's calling himself the empathy opponent, uh, the empathy candidate, he's out of El Cerrito. And I have lots of empathy but empathy is not going to pay our bills, uh, get us out of wars, or uh, help us find ways to get people housed or jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sherry. Sherry, go ahead. Um, Cheryl is actually in my district, and we've been playing phone tag for the last uh, couple of weeks before the convention. And maybe this is actually a question for Kabir. Um, it is a large district. Um, you have a lot of appointment opponents. Could you just briefly kind of give us a rundown on what your strategy is going to be to to win this race and and kind of who you have on board to help you win? Yes. So it's large, but it's not Ge geographically. It's large, but it's the exact same number of people as in the new district for Ms. Barbara Lee and the new district for Mark Desaunier, 760,000 people. Actually, Mark Desaunier has one more person than we do. It's just geographically, it looks long, right? Um, because I've been working, and uh, when I worked in with DOJ and DOD, I worked in all three counties. That was my that was my territory, Solano County, Contra Costa County, and Alameda County. And because I've been doing work in all three counties for the last 25 years, I have built coalitions throughout all the counties. I just been yesterday in, in Antioch working with a coalition of people to get the ground game in uh, Antioch and in Pittsburgh uh, solidified. So this, this, regardless of what you see in a digital billboard, billboards don't win campaigns, ground game wins campaigns, going, talking to the people wins campaigns. So uh, we have seen, especially here in, in the Richmond area, where yes, Chevron can pour millions and millions of dollars and it still doesn't win campaigns. So yes, I'd like to have a million dollars. So anybody got some laying around, uh, Cheryl Sutton, it, Cheryl Sutton for Congress at gmail.com. We'll take that million, but that's, we need money always. But we need people hitting the ground and talking to people about what we are doing. And we've got to counteract this. I think someone said it earlier. We have to counteract the people who are uh, co-opting what it means to be progressive. And OK, so let me not be nice. People who are lying about being a progressive, right? And, and really take that bad message back and say what it really, really means. Because you can't be progressive and say you stand for something and then do something totally opposite as soon as you get the votes, as soon as you get elected. So really it's gotta be people talking and, and saying, and then helping get the votes. Thank I think Ms. So Sudia has her hand up. Sudia, go ahead. Sudia, go ahead. It sounds like you've done great things and you have great plans. And I just also wanna take a um, look at that word progressive because I, I was raised in a family where my parents called themselves progressives. But as soon as Hillary Clinton said, I am a progressive, I said, I am no longer progressive. I am a radical or a democratic socialist. So I never, and I even get uh, emails saying, do you consider yourself a progressive? And I say, as soon as, soon as uh, Hillary Clinton labeled herself as a progressive, I am no longer a progressive. Yes, ma'am. 2005, I got an award. Uh, I call myself a centerfold. 
First time I ever. I, I got a, I got a, 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 an award and I said I'm a, I'm a centerfold. I'm officially a centerfold. Don't anybody panic. It was in other magazine. I had all my clothes on, and I was awarded. Uh, they called me a, a, a radical and a maverick. I was the maverick mom, and it was because number one, I refuse to take no, and two, I always get an answer. I always find a way to make things happen, even if I have two dollars. I'm gonna find a way to make things happen. But yes, I like maverick and radical better. I don't, I'm not a respectability politician. No, we're going to get things happen and we're going to make it happen. Even if we have to go around under above and beneath. I told you guys earlier, I have a disability, a mobility disability. I use crutches and I can walk. I use forearm crutches and I can walk faster than people with, with able body legs. I can get to where I need to go. Nothing stops me. So, yeah. Nothing stops her. The radical, the maverick, Cheryl Suddeth. Thank you so thank much you. for making time. Thank you. I appreciate all of you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait, one more thing. I have to sure. tell you this so you know. So here's your Spanish lesson for today. Is no comprado, no duevelte, irrepeable. It means unbought, unbeholding, unbreakable. Can Say you that? put that in the chat? I will. It's okay. no comprada, <laughs> no de vuelta, in irrepeable means unbought, unbeholding, unbreakable. I might bend, but I don't break. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you guys. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Mark, do you want to introduce the next couple people? Sure, sure. And uh, then Susanna has made it here. Welcome, Susanna. Hey, Susanna. And oh, boy, she's put in a heavy day. <laughs> heavy Are week. Y'all still long we're going to hear about it from her. Fantastic. We're going to also hear from Igor and maybe a couple more. So let's continue on with this part. Fantastic. Well, I, it is a pleasure to introduce the next person who's going to be speaking. Uh, I had the pleasure of producing the very first video interview with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And when I heard her, I heard the future of American politics. Uh, when I talk to this to this person, I hear the future of California. He, like AOC, he is the smartest person in the room, and he's also the nicest person in the room, which is a very rare combination. Uh, he is running for Contra Costa County Clerk. Uh, I can't wait to hear from him. Please welcome Devin Murphy. Hello, Devin, our ahead. Revolution family. Good to see everybody, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been a long weekend. Uh, it's been a long weekend, and I would just love to take a moment to take a breath for myself and for everybody, um, because I know it's been such an exciting weekend at the same time, but we've got a lot of work to do this June 7th. Um, and I say June 7th because I'm excited to also let you all know that I am so excited um, to be a candidate this June 7th election for County, Contra Costa County Clerk Recorder. Um, our revolution family, we currently stand at a critical and momentous moment in our history, um, one in which we're fighting for the very survival of our democracy. Those who sought to overthrow a president a couple of years ago um, are saying, some are saying they're not going to be involved in the fight, this next fight that we have. I'm gonna say that again, the people who stopped to overthrow a last election may not be here to defend our democracy this year and 2024 and beyond. And so as important it is that we make sure we have folks like ourselves on this call organizing and doing the work, we also have to elect the next generation of election administration officials who would hold integrity, who will hold empathy, and who will be here for the results to ensure that we have fair elections and free. Some of you all know me because you all, I'm not new to this family, right? I've been here on calls, but you all endorsed me two years ago when I ran for city council. And when we, when we ran, we won the most votes in Pinole's history. Voting is the cornerstone of our democracy. And that's why it's important now more than ever that we hold a strong and unified front as we combat attacks on our democracy at the most local level. Representation and civic engagement, as you all know, uh, they don't start and end on election day. And as an elected official, as a civic technologist and as a community organizer, I understand firsthand the experiences of our communities across this county. What's at stake most importantly 
if we do not have the tools, the resources, and the energy to make sure our voices are centered. Our Revolution family, we deserve a Contra Costa County clerk who will lead with that empathy, who will lead with integrity, and most importantly and connectedly, will lead with passion and serving the people who utilize the services of the office. And as, as your future clerk recorder, I will do that. My, my focus is very simple. Number one, it's to expand and protect the right to vote. That means implementing new federal state laws that are signed as, uh, as they come, but it also means to protect the most vulnerable by addressing barriers that block them from casting their ballot. Number two is to improve voter outreach and community engagement. It's something that I have done as Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Pinole and will continue to do as your next clerk recorder. That means working with neighborhood associations, tenant groups, local clerks, community-based organizations, school administrators to coordinate voter education. But it also means to create transformative civic education where folks take the, where folks who are doing the organizations like yourselves have the tools and proper energy necessary to make sure they can, you know, have on the ground efforts and facilitate learning. It means leading with empathy and delivering the essential services. Many of us have, have had an experience at the clerk recorder's office, but it means that we have to remember what that experience is like and make that the most positive experience. And last but not least, as I mentioned to you before, it's important for the chief election officer of this county to prioritize the security and the integrity of our elections. That means modernizing our assets and implementing important technological improvements. I'm just going to add this one thing, of course, because many of you all know me from my work in the, you know, advocating for environmental justice. One of the most important things we can do with every single county office is to ensure we build a, build a sustainable county department. And as your next clerk reporter, my focus is going to be building on a sustainable clerk recorder's office. That means prioritizing the acceleration of solar installation. It means establishing energy efficient and zero emission fleet management practices. It means supporting installation at electric vehicle units, as well as bike infrastructure and centering our development around transit orientedness, right? It means to build a more sustainable clerk reporter's office. So I think it's time. And I hope you're with me. The time has come for a people-centered approach at every single aspect of local government. And as your next Contra Costa County clerk recorder, I will make sure that civic engagement as well as civic education and accessibility are at the focus and cornerstone of this office. So I hope you will join me. I'm asking your endorsement like I did two years ago. Uh, we've been in this fight for a long time and we're gonna continue to be in this fight. And so, our revolution, and I hope you'll join me today as we embark on a campaign rooted in transparency, engagement, accountability, empathy, and growing a more inclusive and representative democracy, and ensuring, of course, that our elections are safe, secure, and accessible. This is about bringing the people, our communities, Contra Costa County, to the table. Thank you so much, and I look forward to having your endorsement in this race for Contra Costa County Clerk Recorder. Thank you, Devin, so much. Uh, hang around for a question or two. Absolutely. I think we have a question from Cordell. Cordell, go ahead. Yes. Uh, so, um, Devin, one of the questions I had was um, you said about you know civic engagement. Um, I know this comes up quite often, but um, I'm thinking of like you know I'm thinking like you know how can we get the youth? Uh, when I say youth, I'm talking about high school students. You know, like how can we get them to you know like to participate in this process? Absolutely. Well, first of all, Cordell, I want to say thank you. I think I said this via message, but I want to say thank you for your advocacy in the city of Pinole. Uh, many folks don't know, but Cordell is not even a Pinole resident, but shows up to nearly every city council meeting. And I'm so thankful for your advocacy because that is how we build this movement. What I heard from your question is how do we get youth think how do we increase youth engagement? Um, well, many of you all know I'm 28 years old. I was elected in Pinole two years ago and I am now the youngest serving mayor pro tem in Pinole's history. I say that not to save my accomplishments. I say that to say the work that I'm doing right now is exactly what we need to do to increase youth engagement. I'm proud that one of, the one, of the, one of my own team members on my campaign is the Contra Costa College president. He's a young person who went to Bono Valley High School, connected with me, and is now serving as the president of Contra Costa College and is also on my campaign. 
He helped me build my platform. And he's also very adamant to make sure that we have a youth engagement program that says that even if you're not able to vote, you're still able to participate in it. I know why this is important because I was that young person. At 16 years old, I was in Solano County and Vacaville, a very tough city, I always have to say, registering voters before I was even registered to vote, before I was even able to register to vote. I know how important it is that young folks who are younger than me at 28 years old understand the complexity of the voter registration process so that they not only can vote, but they can help their grandparents and their cousins and their aunts and uncles vote. And so, Cordell, to answer your question, one of the main and key platforms of mine is around building transformative civic education. I'm committed to building a civic education core where I am helping students and young people reach out to their own communities and helping them have the tools and resources to go out into community to get folks engaged in the electoral process around issues that are important to them. I've been doing this work before and so her, serving now as the our court, revolution allow me to enforcement meeting. Hi, Kate. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Welcome. Uh, I've been doing this before, and it's such an amazing opportunity to think about what's possible with 82 staff members, with a $30 million budget that the clerk recorder has. What's possible if we have an organizer like myself in that office? I hope that answers your question, Cordell. Final question. Uh, oh, Sadia, Sadia, go ahead. I was. I want to respond to your question, Cordell. Can't hear you. Am, do I, am I turned off? No, no. We can just hear you a little bit. That's weird. Give us a. I'll sit closer to my computer. Maybe that'll help. Can you hear me now? Go ahead and ask your okay. question. So, um, Cordell was saying, "Well, how do we get youth involved?" I just wanted to say that during the um, primary campaign. We had a number of events at our house um, uh, supporting Bernie, but what we did was uh, a few interactive workshops about the Green New Deal. And so when we did them, there were people there that asked us to do it at our local Oakland Tech High School in a government class. So we did um, an interactive Green New Deal workshop in six government classes, but we decided to always end with a 10 or 15 minute video clip of the sunrise movement so that the youth would get connected with something that other youth was were doing so i think in an, in any way that we can get connection with teachers in middle school or high school and do short workshops um, in classrooms can be really valuable yeah and sadia i think that's a great point the, i, I want to add to that to say the way we get youth elected is the same way we've gotten involved by having people who look like us, who share our same values, who shame our, who share our same experiences in elected office. That's how we do it. We see ourselves and people and we attract ourselves to people who have those same common experiences. Right. And one of the reasons that I'm running for clerk reporter is because I know this is an office that young people have to see. They're going to have to see someone who is like them who has come from their experiences so that they can see themselves in the future of Contra Costa's elections. And so I'm really excited to do that. Final question, Kabir, go ahead. Hey, Devin, another one of my brothers in arms. Uh, same question, who are your opponents? So uh, this is a tough race, y'all. It's a tough race. Um, and I'm actually excited about it. We have. Uh, to my knowledge, of course, the, the filing deadline's not until Thursday, um, but we're supposed to be having three other candidates outside of myself. This is the first time in Contra Costa County's history that we're having an election for the clerk recorder's role. So I have three other candidates, including Kristen Connolly, Vicki Gordon, and Nicholas Spinney. And again, that I am running on a campaign that is aspirational for our communities. I believe that we have a lot of work to do, and I believe that we can't just only limit our visions to what is today. If we're gonna get people out to vote on June 7th, and of course in November, and 2024 and beyond, we've gotta make sure we have somebody that brings people in, that is not only someone who administers the office, but someone who's a collaborator, working with other department offices, working who's a connector, 
working with groups who have never heard about the clerk recorder. And I'll tell you one thing, our revolution, one of the biggest things I'm doing about this race is not just telling people about me running, it's also explaining to people what the office means and what the office does. So I have three other competitors. It is a highly competitive race and that's why I'm coming to you first to ask for your endorsement because I know that this is the group that does the real organizing. I don't have a lot of money. My mom always said, we don't have a lot of money, but some, one of the things we have is a large family. And because I have a large family, I know I can win this. And I know we can win this because our family is more wealthy than any money. I will give my link out because I would love to donate. I would love your donations, but more importantly, this endorsement and the organizing that we do in our community in Contra Costa County matters to me more. Thank you so much, Devin. Thank you so much. Uh, we're fighting for the future of California and that means we need to elect the future of California. Devin Murphy is the future of California. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, speaking of family, speaking of family, we have uh, with us uh, Richmond City Council member, uh, also a member of the Richmond Progressive Alliance. He was with us when we were fighting for workers. He was with us when we were fighting for the environment. He was with us when we were fighting for immigrants. He is now running for mayor of the city of Richmond. Please welcome the one, the only, Eduardo Martinez. Eduardo, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was busy uh, sending out uh, donations to people who uh, listened. <laughs> to their, uh, so, so, so I'm glad to see so many wonderful people running for office um, <laughs> and, and people that I've worked with. I've, I've, worked with, I've worked with Cheryl, I've worked with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, Ruskell and I'm working with Devin. So uh, Devin, I'm really happy to be associated with you and I see us doing wonderful things in the future after we're elected. Well, now, but but even more so after we're elected. So um, I, I've been on the city council for seven years. Uh, I, a retired elementary school teacher. I taught uh, uh, sixth, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. I also worked in uh, Alameda County Juvenile Hall. I set up a seventh, eighth grade self-contained court classroom that was uh, designed specifically for truants pre-expulsion kids from juvenile hall that weren't ready to come back the regular classroom. And um, I did I did well with them. Uh, I consider them my uh, I consider them angels with tarnished wings because because they were. Um, and and all they needed was was uh, direction, uh, which they weren't getting in, in the regular regular environment you know in fact in fact they were uh, they were basically told what not to do as opposed to being shown what to do and 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 that's that's what we need to do uh i i, I believe that a lot of people just need to be shown the possibilities that are out there and that's why we need visionaries who have a picture of how we should move forward to 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 lay out a map for us to follow um uh, I, um, uh, some of the things that, that I've done, I, I, I've worked for the $15 an hour minimum wage. And as Cheryl had said, that's not enough. We need a sustainable wage. And that's something that I will be working on in the future to make sure that that $15 uh, an hour wage gets increased so that people in Richmond can afford to stay in Richmond. Um, and I've also worked for uh, the rights of undocumented workers. I've helped um, keep ICE out of the city of Richmond. And what I want to do in the future is to make sure that, that um, un unregistered voters, uh, people who can't uh, register to vote under the current laws will have the ability to vote uh, locally. And they've done that in other cities, we can do that in Richmond. And, uh, environment is very important. So, so um, I've worked hard to make sure that the AstraZeneca site is cleaned completely before they build on it, because uh, we want to make sure that places that people live are places that people can can continue to live and continue to live uh, in in good health. Um, uh, we've had. 
an overturn of a decision that we made, which was to have a total cleanup. And right now we're fighting with SunCal, not SunCal, but, but with a, a shop off to stop the development at AstraZeneca because they're planning on, on capping it off and building on top of it. Uh, and their plan doesn't allow for daycare, doesn't allow for school, doesn't allow for, for hospitals, doesn't allow for um, uh, convalescent uh, hospitals. Uh, and yet they are allowing people to live there. And it's just ludicrous to me because uh, a child is only in a daycare for a few hours a day, but they're at home even longer. So, so it just doesn't make sense to allow children to live somewhere where they can't have a school. And um, what I want is smart development. We have, um, uh, we have developed, uh, we're, we're developing outside of the uh, main part of Richmond and we need more infill. We need uh, to uh, fill in all the infill houses all the empty lots so that uh, um, its services can it can be consolidated you know right now uh, people are are asking for more police and yet you know the police uh, aren't doing or, or can't do what they need to do so a good way to get more people more feet on the street is to reimagine police safety, which is what we've done in Richmond. Uh, they claim that we've de, uh, what's, what's the word? We've uh, 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 defunded the police, but we didn't defund the police. We reallocated monies. Um, when, when we take money from libraries, when we take money from parks, when we take money from recreation, I don't hear any cries of defunding the library. I don't hear cries of defunding uh, social services. Uh, so, so, you know, we're not defunding, we, we're reallocating. Um, and, and I also see that uh, if we have uh, social workers, people who are able to deal, deal with, with some of the responsibilities that are allocated to police, uh, we can actually have more people on the street because they'll, they'll be paid less than police. Um, so um, there's we're also trying to make sure that uh, corporations uh, pay their fair share. And uh, I, I have a fan here. Uh, uh, we also want to make sure that corporations pay their fair share. So, so we have passed the Measure U, which um, uh, changes the way that, that, that taxes are being done. Uh, they're, they're, they're um, geez, my, my cat just got me confused. But uh, but but we're um, wanting to to uh, uh, tax uh, tax people by 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 what their profits are, or as opposed to uh, the set amount that they've had. And they complain that um, uh, they complain that 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 business taxes are going up far more than that than is reasonable. And they even, uh, industry, business community, even offered to double their taxes uh, uh, to, to increase our tax base uh, so that we wouldn't pass the measure U. And, and my point was, if you can so easily choose to double your taxes, that tells me that you've been paying way under what you should be paying. You know, so, so, so anyway, um, uh, this tax will will actually uh, increase some, some you know some businesses by by hundred percent you know um, uh, but it only shows that that uh, uh, they've been paying way less than they should and then and then I'm also working on a public bank uh, with uh, uh, Alameda County in San Francisco um, and and cities and so. So you know, there, there's a lot of ways that we can work together um, and the environment, um, uh, Richmond has uh, our, our Power Richmond, which is working on a um, just transition policy. And so 
uh, I want to make sure that we have a policy where we can all start working together as a city, as a community on a just transition. So we need to make sure that, that, that we're not just talking to the people at, we wanna make sure that the people at the top aren't making the policy. The policy has to come from the people at the bottom who are living the life that, uh, that, that the just transition is going to affect. Uh, um, but, but we also know that, uh, that the workers at Chevron are part of the community. It's the management that's the problem. It's the management that's not allowing the workers to do what they actually need to do in order to run a safe, um, uh, a safe plant. And it's uh, and it's also uh, that that it's also um, uh, something that that we need to do with everyone sure that we come up with a policy that works for everyone. I mean, there's transportation, there's the, you know, there's, there's the environment switching from, from uh, fossil fuels to, to uh, 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 renewables uh, and doing that in a way that the everyday person is able to afford the transition. We need to make sure that we have a way for, for um, people of lower incomes uh, in, to be able to buy electric stoves um, as opposed to, you know, saying you can't have a gas stove anymore and then expect them to make the transition on their own. Um, uh, so so there's, there's just so many considerations that, that need to be taken uh, into account and, um, and we need to do it together. So um, that's uh, what I want to do. Great, great. Thank you, Wardo. Oh, we have a question from Cordell. Cordell, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sound like a broken record, but um, uh, thank you, uh, Eduardo, for uh, your talk, uh, your discussion. So one of the concerns that I had was, um, and I don't know if this was mentioned, but um, about how you how we okay. Let me put it, let me rephrase that. Uh, how will you be able to work with the business community on try, on retaining uh businesses? That will that that do want to come to Richmond. Well, you know, um, people have people have tried to make the RPA as being anti-business, but we're not anti-business. We're actually pro-business. We're for businesses that uh, fit Richmond. One of the issues that we've always had in Richmond is that we've never had a proactive planning department. Our planning department has basically sat back and waited, waited for developers to come, and then we negotiate with the developers as to what should be done. Instead, what we need to do is to develop a policy that tells developers before they come what is expected of them to fit with the growth of Richmond. We have to have a not just not just a plan of where we want to of how we want to move forward, but uh, not just a plan of of moving forward, but a plan, but, but a vision of how we want to move forward. We have to have a vision of the kinds of businesses that will make Richmond prosper, the kinds of businesses that will give jobs to locals, that will train locals, that will uh, uh, include the entire community in a growth that is good for everyone. Great. Kabir, you have your hand up. Kabir, go ahead. Yes, full disclosure, I'm also on Eduardo's campaign team, but uh, same question, Eduardo, who are your uh, current opponents? Well, um, it's it's hard to say at this point. Uh, Demolish Johnson had uh, uh, um, uh, jumped into the race, um, uh, but now he seems to be uh, running for Congress against Cheryl. <laughs> so I'm not sure uh, what his plans are. Uh, and then there's um, Devin Mer uh, um, uh, well, what is his name? Uh, Kabir. <laughs> uh, uh, John Dunning. John Dunning. Thank you, John Dunning, uh, who um, is um, has a consulting business um, uh, and uh, uh, some feedback here. 
Um, anyway, Sean, Sean Dunning's running. I've, I've met with him, uh, and uh, he seems to be. Uh, he seems to be in the process of figuring out what his what his platform is. Right now, it's uh, he's just running on on uh, having a having a city that works together. I should just uh, read something from the chat from Devin Murphy. He says, I'm not running for Richmond mayor. I promise I endorse you. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Devin, I endorse you also. Well, Eduardo, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you so much. And, and you remind us that we are a movement. And when we elect all of our, all of our friends, our family, our progressive stalwarts and champions, we're electing a movement into power. And that helps you in Richmond, that helps Devin and Pinol and of all of Contra Costa County. It helps Aisha in, in South Bay. I mean, it helps all of us. And, uh, and thank you for all your work you've done. When, when Eduardo wins, the people win. So thank you. Uh, and, I, and also just a quick note with the talking about business in Richmond. When the Richmond Progressive Alliance came into power, there was an absolute renaissance in the local economy, thanks to all of you. So let don't don't let people forget that. All right, I'm just wondering: is uh, George Syrup here with us? No. George, are you with us? I don't see him. So I uh, so we have a we have a, a guest who is coming who is running for office in San Francisco. We usually don't try to step on the toes of our brothers and sisters, the San Francisco Bernie Kratz. So, um, but we did agree to, to let her speak for uh, two or three minutes, uh, um, uh, uh, to knowing that uh, everything that is San Francisco based has to go through San Francisco Bernie Kratz. Uh, welcome, uh, Bianca Von Craig. Bianca, are you there? Yeah. But you got it. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on, everyone. I, I, I think I, I've seen a, a lot of you before in various other meetings. We like to get around and meet everybody. Um, uh, I guess I'm not looking for an endorsement, but you know, I just like to let people know that we're we're still out there. We're plugging away. Uh, our social media has gone up by fifteen thousand percent. Where have we have north of 300 volunteers worldwide, and we're looking to get more. Um, and uh, you know, I I was listening to Cheryl, and it's interesting. This uh, I'm actually running in the district that used to be yours. It's now at San Francisco's District 11. And uh, yeah, I I empathize with a lot of the things you say. I, I'm not going to be a this kind of establishment. Uh, politician, I'm. I told I told somebody yesterday at the uh, the Chessa rally. You know, they're like, well, you know, you got great ideas, but you're never gonna probably gonna get most of them through. And it's like maybe not, but I can out the assholes who are holding up the process. And um, <clears throat> you know, because we need these things built bad. We need green new. We need the green new deal. We need Medicare for all. We need universal basic income more than anything else. And I'm the only Democrat in California who signed the term limit pledge. I support the elimination of the electoral college and establishment of ranked choice voting nationwide. Those, those are no brainers, people. I can't imagine anybody who would be opposed to just such basic, basic, you know, privilege for the voter, other than somebody who just wants to maintain the status quo. Uh, universal basic income is the best chance we have to achieve equity, equality, and we're uh, we're talking to Labor Secretary Robert Wright to uh, firm that up for us. Um, Bianca, what office are you running for? Oh, uh, House of Representatives. Like I'm running against Nancy Pelosi, Mark. Very interesting. All right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, That's a headline. <laughs> I, I assumed that people picked up on San Francisco, you know, beyond Congress. There's only one office, really. But next time, yeah, I'll definitely not bury it. Um, the, you know, one of the things that I've enjoyed in this process is 
when I when I've come up to people and I've been asking for signatures or whatever, um, nobody nobody says to me, "Oh no, why are you doing that?" Or you know, she hasn't been so bad. Everybody has been like, "Get her, get that bitch, take her down." I can't stand her anymore. And really it's been 30, what is it? 35, 37 years now of her running her mouth, lining her pocket. You know, she, her, her net worth has tripled from um, $50 million in 2005. <clears throat> and, you know, we all, we all remember the, uh, the stock market scandal earlier with her uh, using her position to bet on the market. You know, she's just no good. She's no good. Uh, the latest political poll says that 60% of registered voters want her gone. And I'm gonna execute that for her. So uh, I'll, we're always looking for donations. That would be real nice. Uh, we just had to pay a lot of hefty fees. So uh, we'll put the link in the chat and uh, the rest of the stuff so you can find out more about us. But I appreciate you guys letting me um, have some time and um, I'm always behind you. <laughs> Bianca, thank you so much. Thank you for, for stopping by. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, All right, with we're, that. We're uh, ready to move on to some other things now. Uh, we've heard from some amazing candidates and I noticed most people have stuck it out and they're still here. And so now we're gonna talk about a couple other things. Uh, Igor Tregub, OREB member and super, super activist is going to talk for a minute about, uh, for a couple minutes about the situation in Ukraine and maybe how people can make donations. And that will be followed by Susanna Williams, uh, who will be talking about this weekend at the convention and maybe a little bit about a revolution nationals idea. Anyway, uh, go for it, Igor. Uh, thank you so much, sister. And I don't know if it'll be a couple of minutes, but I will be as oh, whatever synced as I possibly can. Um, um, I think most of you know me, but what I may not have told you is that I'm a native of Kiev, Ukraine. And I would like to start by reading um, an email that I got uh, from a childhood friend of mine, uh, which I first read when we were doing a flag raising of the Ukrainian flag in the city of Berkeley earlier this week. My name is Ksenia Aleksantyva. I'm 35 years old, Kiev native girl. War came to my home on February 24th in the early morning. It was 4 a.m. My mom, 91-year-old granny, and two cats were sleeping when bombing first started. Day one was oh, on. Man, it was really good, really. Our brains didn't want to accept the fact that it really started. We had an advantage. Food was prepared for the if something were to happen times. We decided to stay home and wait. The next morning again at 4 a.m., a rocket exploded right above our home and then fell 100 meters away from us. Plan A didn't work, so we took a decision to leave. Mom calling all the drivers she knows, roads blocked with traffic jams, me monitoring the latest news online, all at the same time. No real fear, more of an apathy to fall asleep and wake up in old reality. In 10 hours, we managed to find a car, packed and left. 40 kilometers in three hours, but it could have been worse. We reached our country home. As we got to know later, these were the latest hours that we could actually leave. Kiev got closed in uh, that night. Day three, we wake up at 2.30 a.m. from an explosion. Questions or I should say Putin's forces attacked Masokiv Petroleum Base, which is 15 kilometers away from us. There was a huge red light all around. The fire stayed for many hours until it was stopped. If you ask me what my life looks like now, 
It's a total mess of news 24 seven, shaking from each sound and looking around where in terms of where to hide in case of a new attack. Reading news online, communicating with my team at work, replying to calls and messages from all around the world, coordinating those who can donate to various humanitarian causes or those who can shelter our people abroad. Uh, mind you, this was at the beginning of the week. So at that point, it was five days of a call in center, now 14 days under the bombs. I would like to thank every single human for coming to protest for each penny donated to our people for each pair of shoes given to us for every report over social media, every signed petition, every action against uh, Putin's forces. Make the uh, quintessential American dream possible for Ukraine today. We pray for freedom, peace, and a chance to raise our new generation in a country out of war. I was born in Kiev, Ukraine. My parents left when I was five years old, when it was still part of the Soviet Union. We left because uh, we identified as Jewish so that we could have a better life, so that I could grow up pursuing activism alongside of all of you without fear of repression, repercussions, or even possible assassinations, like those who um, have come before and have tried to fight for freedom um, in Russia under Putin. For 22 years, Ukraine had a taste of small d democracy and they don't want to go back. I am Ukrainian American, but I'm also Jewish. And for those of us who have those identities, there is a collective fear. Um, there's a collective feeling of generational trauma. I firmly believe that this is our 1949 moment right now. I want to come back and visit my childhood friend who I haven't seen in decades in a Ukraine that is free and clear and has the possibility of its people having self-determination. In the immortal words of Sophie Shaw, who was a very courageous young woman who during the Nazi regime was executed for the simple act, the horrible act of passing out information about the importance of fighting the Nazis, the importance of freedom and small d democracy. Her last words were, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up for righteous cause? But how many have to die on the battlefield in these days? How many young promising lives? What does my death matter if by our acts Thousands are warned and alerted. Make no mistake, and I talk to folks every day at 3 or 4 a.m. because of the 11 hour time difference. This is not academic. This is a battle for freedoms and democracy in our entire world. Because first, they came for the Ukrainians. But then, because Putin has a list, and it's a very scary one, they're going to come for, and they already have come for political dissidents. Then they're going to come for members of the LGBTIQ community, those who identify or are closeted but are transgender. And then they're going to come for everyone who does not want the same thing that Putin does as an authoritarian leader who does not believe in democracy and has a Cold War mentality. This is a battle between love and hate. 
I hope that together we can make sure that truth prevails over disinformation, democracy prevails over autocracy, freedom prevails over fiefdom. We must act because complacency is one very dangerous step away from complicity. So I'm going to put in the chat um, ways that you are able to contribute. I'm very grateful for your generosity. Together, we have raised close to $20,000. I have been coordinating directly with those who need humanitarian aid right now. And every single day that my credit union is able to be open and give me money from the money that we raise, I go to the bank and that money goes towards immediate aid. And I'm very grateful for that. I'm going to say one more thing. Susanna is going to talk more about the platform and the CDP convention that just concluded today. Now is the time. Now is the time to petition Congress and the Biden administration to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel, starting with that controlled by maniacal, authoritarian, hateful, genocidal leaders. Now is the time. And this is why I'm incredibly proud, despite fierce resistance at the 11th hour from those who side with the fossil fuel industry, that we were able to pass the strongest platform in history on environmental issues, getting ourselves off of fossil fuel by 2030. We did that, not me, us. And now we have to shout from the rooftops and we have to present that platform to our leaders in the nation's capital. Um, we must continue. To, the platform is not perfect. There are still things that need to be fixed in two years, but I want to make it clear that now, um, you know, if you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have said the existential crisis of our time is that of climate change. Now I say to you, there are two related dual existential crises, that of climate change and that of brinksmanship, where we are unable to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels and are completely dependent on authoritarian leaders like Putin. And that's why we need to make a complete break. Now is the time to do it. I thank you so much for listening. Um, this has been an incredibly stressful time and I would not be here truly without everyone's support and being able to give back. So thank you so much. Igor, you just broke my heart with this. Let's, let's hear from Susanna, who will give us an update from the platform, about the platform that Igor was just talking about, and tell us other things that are happening around the party. Susanna, go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Igor. Ah, I'll tell you, thank you for what you're doing. And I think the boots on the ground and all the work at the bordering communities are probably doing the most good for the Ukrainian people right now. Um, this is like probably like at its most fundamental, a grassroots effort in so many ways of the word. So thank you. Um, okay, um, CDP convention, oh joy. 
Um, for those people who've been doing this for decades, God love you, because I've only been doing this for six-ish years, and seriously, I feel like my head's going to explode. <laughs> um, I, seriously, I didn't do much until Friday because I had work obligations and some other stuff going on. But Friday, I, I popped into the JEDI, J-E-D-I -E program that the CDP seems to be insanely proud of. Um, tons of PowerPoints. JEDI stands for, I believe, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Keep those words in mind. because They seem to be missing from all of the progressive activist treatment throughout this entire party. Um, day one was general sessions. Pretty much the same as always. The first half of the morning was CDP officers and others making all of us who refuse to contribute money to the party because they won't tell us where they're donating it, where it comes from, how much there is of it, um, absolutely refuse to listen to our pleas to divest ourselves from fossil fuel, from law enforcement money and all that fun stuff. So they spent the first half of that um, day berating us and trying to guilt trip, trip us into donating. The second part of it was talking heads. It was all the state um, um, candidates who wanted um, our vote for their endorsement later on in the day. Um, in true CDP fashion, God, God forbid they listen to any of us who work in technology who could actually help them with a program to do electronic voting that would actually work. Um, they had some snafus and um, the voting got extended. Um, no big surprises there. Um, some progressive people that I would have loved to have seen made the cut for endorsement didn't. Um, we attempted to get some signatures in to pull some endorsements. Um, there were two that I really thought had legs and were gonna happen. But as usual, the CDP loves to um, basically make their bylaws and rules a moving target. So every time we figure out exactly how to make something happen, they change the rules. So in their archaic fashion, um, not having this in person where we could run around and get the 300 required signatures to pull um, a candidate off of that consent calendar, we had to print out a document, fill it out by hand, wet signatures would not allow electronic signatures, then we had to turn, scan it in, turn it into a PDF, and then email it to the candidate for submission by like 11 o'clock last night or midnight or something crazy. Needless to say, um, none of those um, passed muster, so the consent calendar moved forward this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, the whole thing passed. Um, one of the people who um, spoke up in favor of approving the consent calendar actually made the statement that all of us had spent all this time and voted for all of these candidates on the consent calendar, which was not true. All of those people on that consent calendar were for state assembly, um, state senate races, and those incumbents automatically get endorsement. They do not have to be pull, um, pulled from a consent calendar. There is zero incentive for an incumbent to do a good job, none. They do not have to read the platform. They do not have to agree with the platform they automatically get considered for endorsement and it is dang hard to pull someone. It's happened, but it is hard. Um, so that unfortunately passed, I voted no. Um, and then onto the platform and Igor is right. There are some amazing things on our platform. We have consistently had the strongest platform in the entire planet. Um, that platform is good. The problem is that the people that this California Democratic Party endorses, there is no obligation on their part to do anything um, in concurrence with that platform. We finally put something in, I think, where they actually have to read it or say they read it, but there are no rules that say, if you get our endorsement and our money and our help, that you have to at least abide by our platform. Um, it's, I think, one of the worst things about the party and it really needs to change. But that platform is amazing. Igor is absolutely right. We need to hold people accountable to it. Um, there are a few glitches. Um, there was a little problem with the charter school. There's some language in there that I listened to somebody who seemed to know what they were talking about that said it wasn't a bad thing. But I guess it turned out that maybe it was a bad thing. But that platform almost didn't get approved. That vote was very, very close. Um, so hopefully some people are paying attention. Um, let's see what else happened there. Um, that was pretty much the it for action items today. I bailed a little bit early because you know you can only take so much. Um, 
yeah, that's um, that was pretty much the convention in a nutshell. Um, the best part for me personally was the Progressive Caucus on Saturday night, where Ummer and several other people basically called Rusty and the whole crew out for all the shenanigans that I had previously mentioned. That was good. I felt at home. I was among almost 500 of my fellow activists. Um, that was awesome. That was totally worth showing up for. And as far as I'm concerned, the highlight of the entire convention. Um, and yeah. Um, so um, Carol, Suzanne, talk about the, I'm sorry, Suzanne, I would sorry. add to that about the Progressive Caucus that Amir basically said that we have been so disrespected by the party itself that we should work with organizations like um our revolution, our revolution yeah. East Bay and the yeah. uh, pda and all of these groups to organize because we're not getting any help from the party yeah, is basically what he running said. the work was the, the working families party and i gotta tell you i i've been a delegate now i think this is my third term i have done far more good for our country our environment getting progressive candidates elected with the work that I have done with our revolution than I have ever done as a delegate. And it is way less frustrating. Let me tell you, yeah. I'm involved in my central committee. I'm the first vice chair of the Contra Costa Central Committee. I, uh, <laughs> this job is way bigger than I thought it was when I got drafted for it. Um, I oversee endorsements and elections. That was where I was previous to here. And that is like a bear of a job compared to how we do our endorsements. Um, and I think our process is far superior. So I, I absolutely agree. I think the activist organizations are where we should all be. Um, we can do more good. We're appreciated. Um, it's a collaborative effort. People are willing to listen to our ideas. And um, yeah, we are completely disrespected by the party. I've seen a few things here and there get better. But honestly, since Rusty's been in power, it's gotten worse. Um, so it, it, it just can, every meeting that we have, we try to do something good. And then we get slammed down with behind the scenes maneuvering. And then they put some new bylaw in place that makes it impossible for us to ever do that again. So yeah, crazy stuff. Especially, so anyway, over. especially because they controlled the whole electronics. I mean, there was no I'm way anybody could, everything. nobody could have even. No chat. We didn't even have our, yeah, no video, no chat, nothing, absolutely nothing. Like we're our, it's useless for us, you know, to be there practically because, you know, they got a few people, they've got it all set up ahead of time as to who's going to, you know, make a motion or support it or speak to it. It's, you know, we saw that, Igor, with the special meeting that we forced. We saw how they orchestrated that behind the scenes. I mean, we sat there and watched it unfold and knew exactly what was happening. There was absolutely nothing we could do about it. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm well, hating. We uh, need Carol, to grow the Progressive Caucus. Absolutely. And it, I mean, that Progressive Caucus is, I mean, there were almost 500 people there last night. Wow. Um, till, till almost midnight, right? About 11.30. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, it started at seven o'clock. So, you know, people yeah. are, people are hanging in, people are activated, people are working. We're all donating money. But we're giving money to progressive candidates. We're not giving it to the party. I don't give a dime to the party unless it's just my, you know, registration fees or whatever. It's like, mm -mm, I'll just give it to candidates. Thank you very much. I know where it's going. Yeah. So, well, anyway, um, I, 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 Igor you know, also you mentioned that one of the places where there was just the most disrespect was about the environmental platform and uh, the co-chair of the environmental caucus, RL, was just totally disrespected by the building trades guy and then even from the even from the platform on saturday he he berated her um in front of the whole building three thousand people yeah i heard about that the building trades we had a little situation with the contra costa um central committee um with our issues committee um over a conquered development with a very very bad developer i mean honestly this guy's the worst developer in the entire state um, and the building trades went after the group of us who actually um, came forward and you know put forward the resolution to actually do something. Um, and and some of the names that this building trades person called us, I mean seriously, uh, it violates any code of conduct any of us have seen. So they need to really like take a hard look at what they are saying to us because this is not cool. I mean I think most of us support unions, but 
come on, you don't, you don't, you know, go around doing this stuff. So yeah, no, I agree. Um, hey, Carol, do you want me to talk about the um, our revolution national thing too now? Yeah, do you want to, I just want to say one thing. I heard from Bobby Lopez that they also used very language supporting charter schools in the platform. Yes. Yes, it's, it, there was some support in the platform for charter schools. Um, there was some back and forth right before the vote. Um, I, I respect Ann Crosby and she usually really, you know, it's on top of it. So she was thinking that um, first she called the alert, but then they said, oh, it was a duplicate in the platform. So she's like, okay, fine. And then, um, then it turned out at, uh, like after the vote, I guess a lot of people found out that there was language in there supporting charter schools that has no business in there. So mm -hmm. that's something that we are going to have to change. But with the platform, we couldn't pull an individual plank or a part of a plank. We mm -hmm. were told it was all or nothing. It was an up or down vote. So mm -hmm. if we voted it down, which it almost got voted down, if we yeah. voted it down, then the entire platform, which included all the amazing environmental stuff that they had fought so hard to get put in, would have also been kicked out and we would have been back to the previous platform. So yeah, that all or nothing, that should not have happened. We should have been able to pull a plank from that. And that was not allowed for, because they make up the rules. Yeah. On, yes. So yeah, that was pretty much it. So anyway. Susanna, okay, so I, think Rus so I think Ruskell oh. has his hand up for a quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ruskell, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, because I'm also, um, uh, Assembly District 14 delegate representing Vallejo, um, which I forgot to mention earlier when I spoke earlier. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, it was, well, my question is, would it have been, it there's, it would have been possible, uh, just like what I've seen on city council, um, where you could break up um, parts of an item like for example, we get to vote, like all the good thing, like in terms of the platform agenda item, like uh, if we could like vote on what needs to be voted on and move through the good things and then just and then just separate the charter school plank and just take it to a vote and see where it goes. Yeah, in a rational organization that follows Robert <laughs> like recognize rules of a meeting order, that would be the way you would handle it but not the party, they make up the rules. They were extremely clear. They said we absolutely could not pull a single item off, a part of an item, nothing. Literally said, it is an up or down vote. That language was used by, I believe, Kobe King, who is the parliamentarian guy. Yeah, that, we had, that was it, that was our choice. That should not have been the case. Just like we're not allowed to amend an agenda. Heck, we're usually not even allowed to see an agenda until the meeting starts. And somebody posts a link in chat, which is completely disabled for all of us, but then they can post yeah. their random little crap in there. But yeah, no, but you're absolutely right, Ruskal. That's the way it should have been handled. That's the way it would be handled in pretty much any meeting, but not there. Very frustrating. Yeah. So, and um, and, and, thank, and uh, oh, also thank welcome. you to our fellow delegates, um, uh, for whether it's AD 14, 15, um, you know, for uh, voting with your conscience and fighting a good fight. Uh, and we had a good time. Uh, I do a second. We did have a good time at the Progressive Caucus uh, last night. <laughs> yes, that was a good time. I'm an AD, I was an AD 11. That's where I was elected. Apparently, I'm now an AD 15. So, um, hello, redistricting. Igor, question? Comment? Um, comment. Yeah, just wanted to add some more color to this. So, I texted Colby King, who is a former parliamentarian of the party, but is now the rules chair um, about that very thing. And he said that, yes, under Robert's rules, you absolutely can. Um, it's a privileged motion to sever something out that you want to take a separate vote on. It doesn't even need a second, but he, you know, verbatim from him on his text, um, under these rules that were apparently adopted, you can't do that. Um, now, it is a double-edged sword. Um, in order to ask for an amendment, it would have taken 300 signatures after Friday night when the platform was adopted. 
The platform committee went on for 11 hours. We started at 10 a.m. Um, we ended just after uh, 9 p.m. when I finally ate my lunch for that day. Um, and then between then and 5 p.m. the next day, um, you would have had to get 300 signatures. Um, now, I want to say something. I know this meeting is being recorded, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the building trades introduced a whole bunch of amendments at the 11th hour. Literally, I was um, this past week from 8 a.m. last Saturday when I first saw the language to um, uh, yesterday or the day before when we were finalizing the language in between trying to wire money into a war zone for humanitarian aid, I was trying to negotiate uh, uh, with Aurel Miller, my predecessor on language. Uh, we were actually able to get down to a manageable list of things, um, but the building trades wanted biomass. They wanted to, into the Green New Deal plank, they actually wanted to get rid of the Green New Deal plank. They wanted biodiesel. They wanted to uh, have us support dams, which is a longstanding no-no among the environmental community. Um, they, they wanted to destroy rooftop solar and all sorts of other things. And we were able to actually find consensus there. Um, and they were, you know, under negotiation, they were able to seed some of those, but those were the four things that we couldn't agree on. And so the way to resolve that would have been for us and for them to present their case on Saturday during the platform committee. But instead, um, the head of the building trades got on and ended up trashing the platform committee and complaining about how they were not heard. Even though we spent 30 hours just in this last week alone negotiating, um, I have to tell you uh, the, the co-chairs of the platform committee, Julie Sue and Michael Soto, if you get a chance, please send them a thank you note because Julie Sue in particular, who isn't always on our side. She's a San Francisco moderate, mind you. But this pissed her off so much that she gave them the time of day and she spoke truth to power. And it was a, incredibly courageous of her. Um, I only hope that she will be reappointed next year as platform chair. That's not a given. So uh, if you want to retain someone who actually believes in the rule of law and people working within the process of the party, uh, please send a note of thanks. Um, I will uh, put in the chat um, Julie Sue's and Michael Soto's email um, and please let them know that you appreciate so much what they did because there were about 25 objectionable amendments and thanks to their work, we were able to uh, get rid of all of them and actually reduce the year for net zero emissions from 2050 to 2030, which is a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that update. Yeah, I heard that meeting was long and I heard about the remarks that were directed to Julie. Um, Mark, you got your hand up. Yeah, uh, my heart goes out to all of you fighting this good fight uh, inside the party. It is appreciated. And, and I know I know how hard it is. I just want to say something about the building trades. Yeah, of course, the leadership, they are our enemy. They're fighting against everything that we're trying to do in this environmental movement. But talk to the membership. The membership is, if they're not quite on our side, they are nervous. They are wanting to know what the environmental movement and all of us progressives are thinking about and talking about because they see all these Teslas on the road, they see gas stations disappearing from the side corner streets. So they're getting antsy and scared, never mind the leadership. Also, speaking as someone who I, I tried to get uh, military industrial complex money out of the party. And I, I went to four parliamentarians to get as ironclad as possible. Three, three of them not conservative, uh, three of them not progressive, three, one of them they're very conservative uh, parliamentarians. And I got as ironclad as I could and Rusty Hicks, he had it stalled out in committee, and then and then it became a civil rights violation. It would be a civil rights violation of individuals uh, not being able to give money to the party. And so it, it got crazy, crazy excuses not to do it. 
So really, if you can find some way to punch through, do it, do it. That's all. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Diana, do you um, want to continue? Uh, and then Sherry yeah, wants Gordon, to talk a minute. Okay, Gordon has his hand up here. Gordon, oh. let me do this one quick thing and then go to Gordon. Um, this will this will take like two minutes. So um, a lot of you probably know who Mike Olis is. Um, Mike's with our Revolution National, and he's kind of our go-to person. Um, and he he came to us. And um, I don't know if you all know this, but our Revolution East Bay, we are um, registered with the state of California as a 501c4 corporation, um, which allows us to, um, to work for candidates. However, there's some, some rules where we are not supposed to collaborate directly with campaigns. And um, so it's like, you know, fun stuff during campaign season that we end up walking a line. Mike came to us and our Revolution National um, has started doing this and apparently a lot of other um, 501c4 corporations out there are doing this, where if you have an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, um, which is essentially a contract with a campaign that you can be paid by that campaign and work on that, camp, um, that particular campaign. Um, this has not been tested in the courts or anything like that, but nobody seems to be being sued for it. So Mike is gonna send us over like a sample of what that memorandum of understanding would look like um, our Revolution National is doing this. Um, they're exploring it for some Bay Area can, um, campaigns right now. Um, so it's a way for us to get more involved with our candidates, our endorsed candidates' campaigns. It's also a way for us to generate more money to spend on said candidates' campaigns. Um, so um, stay tuned. Um, I'm going to get the stuff from Mike and take a look at it and kind of see what it says. And then we should probably have somebody who's an attorney weigh in. Um, I'm a paralegal, but I am not an attorney. Um, so we should probably get somebody who knows what they're doing to kind of weigh in. But yeah, so that's something that's an option out there that we are exploring. We just want to let y'all know. So back to you, Mark and Carol. And okay, Gordon I know still has Gordon hand. wanted to speak and Sherry has something to speak about also. And then I'm, I'm ready to wrap it up, I think. Okay, a lot has been said at this meeting and elsewhere about uh, foregoing funding from police unions and, and uh, other bad actors. I've never heard anybody say, can we get politicians to forego funding from people in the health business, big pharma, the insurance companies, yield. I think we need to add it to the list. Good point. Very good point. Alfred has his hand up too, Carol. Okay, Alfred. Sure, and on that point of the healthcare, one way that the party has tried to weasel its way out of it is they say, we won't take money from for-profit healthcare, but then that still opens the door for nominally non-profit, but still really big business healthcare, such as Kaiser, to Kaiser, yep. funnel, funnel money into the campaigns. So, when working on that, just make sure it covers both for-profit and non-profit healthcare. Okay, Sherry. Um, in addition to Igor, Igor, don't go away. In addition to the things that Igor was burdened with this week, um, he, I don't know if you know, many of you know, he is also uh, the vice chair of the, um, Alameda County Central Committee. And as vice chair last Wednesday, he did a phenomenal job of um, having a tribute to Terry Sandoval, who was the chair and who passed away less than a week ago, very suddenly. Um, I can't say that I was ever really particularly a friend of Terry, but she was a friend to a lot of people. And if you were at that memorial, there were some very, very heartwarming, heartfelt um, feelings about her passing. And of course, as someone who had someone very close to me who I loved pass suddenly, that's an additional burden is to have someone just one day they're there and then the next day they're not. Um, and I would just say for my part on Terry is our friend Austin sometimes um, has a hard time communicating and 
for that reason is sometimes not taken seriously and not given the time to speak. And what has endeared me to Terry is at Central Committee, because Austin is a, a elected delegate um, to Central Committee, is she always allowed him the time to be able to speak. She always gave him respect that he deserved and did not deny him his chance to speak. And to me, that just shows what a great heart she had, that no matter who you were, no matter what you had to say, if you were a radical or uh, I'm, I'd like to know some of the, the things that Cheryl said, but you know, even though you're a rebel, which is what I consider myself and not necessarily aligned with, with uh, some of the other things, she would still give you the time to speak. So I would just like us to remember that even though sometimes we're not on the same side, we're still on a better side than the alternative. And Terry was a fighter and I, 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 we're gonna feel her loss. So thank you for just thinking of her in, in memory. Okay, Cheryl, did you have your hand up? No, ma'am, I was just agreeing. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, Alfred and then Ruskell and then we'll see what's next. And Joaquin, okay. Alfred, did you want, have anything to say? I guess not. Okay, Ruskell. Yes, uh, I was wondering if we could uh, adjourn our meeting in memory um, and also uh, solidarity to the people of Ukraine and um, and also the appreciation to all of our delegates here uh, who are members of or or East Bay to just keep uh, fighting the good fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not quite adjourning yet, but yes. Okay, did you have something to say, Joaquin? You, you're showing your hand. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I went to the uh, Code Pink rally in uh, San Francisco today, and that was a great show of support for Ukraine. And some of the, <clears throat> there were hundreds of people right at the ferry building there. Um, Slogans were no war with Russia, Russia out of Ukraine, no NATO in Ukraine, no nuclear war, negotiations, not escalation. So I think it was a good, <clears throat> you know, uh, set of demands and very, we marched up to uh, Senator Feinstein's office building Anyway, um, we got to get in the streets as well as the, you know, do all the grunt work in the meetings. <laughs> so we got to get out there. The uh, last thing I'd say is everybody in our group should be on that uh, googlegroups.com, you know, our internal email so we can share all this kind of stuff that's going on. Okay, um, we always close with singing, but right before that, we'd like to give people a chance if you have an announcement that hasn't been covered during the meeting, or if you want to just say hi, you know, I'm so and so, just so everybody's included. We're going to do that now. And if you do make an announcement, you're limited to one minute max. So, would anybody like to say anything? We have some people here that, I mean, I don't know everybody here. I'd love to have people say, hi, I'm this, I do that, whatever. No, come on. I, I'll take it. Okay, hi, Cordell, welcome. So uh, my name is Cordell and I'm a community activist. So I would like to invite our revolutionary, our revolution East Bay to the Richmond Chamber of Commerce mixer um, on March 24th at Anavi's uh, table in Richmond at 5 p.m. And tickets are fifteen, uh, $10, uh, $10 for, um, for members and $15 for non-members. So 
it's going to be a wonderful event and that's it. Okay, can you put it in the chat, please? Or could somebody put it in the chat? Okay. Um, Gordon, did you have something to say or you're done? He's still showing your hand. Okay, Brody. We can't hear you. Unmute yourself. I just unmuted. Yes. Okay. My name is Brody Hilp, and I'm the president of the Saramon Valley Democratic Club in Danville, Saramon area. We're having a house party for Dinah Becton for people to come and get to just talk to her individually. Um, and um, I'll put my email in chat in case you want to bring friends. We, okay. <laughs> It's going to be in Danville. Also, um, on the 24th of March, we're having a meeting and we're going to have a forum with all three candidates of the county clerk. And we're also going to hear from the, the candidate, uh, Ben Therio, for sheriff. Okay. Thank I, you. I did have something to say. I apologize for the uh, problem with the microphone. There's going to be a rally in Antioch. Uh, and it's going to be between one and three this coming Saturday. Uh, I'm not sure about the location, but it's against drilling. And young people are organizing it. So it's, a, it's an opportunity, I believe, for um, our revolution, East Bay and other progressives to lend them a hand. Thank you. OK, great. Um, anybody else? Are we ready to? Uh... Ruskell, do you want to repeat what you said earlier for our way of closing and then we'll do the singing? That was very powerful the way you phrased it. You still there? It appears to be still there. Well, let's dedicate this meeting to the people of Ukraine, to the people that are fighting, that are endangered, people that are trying to make their way west and uh, always pray for peace. I second that. And uh, tribute to our friend Terry Sandoval, who passed away very untimely. Okay, that does it, folks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, it was a very moving meeting. Okay, Sudia. So